Welcome to Teaching the Truth with Pastor Eric C. Bogan. Clearly define what I am to do. Let every word penetrate the heart. Let what is said leave them running to your arms. Use me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Today, I want to share with you a message that I'm entitling Honor Restored. Honor Restored. On this Father's Day, I want to talk about a very important subject as it relates to fathers, men, and that is the topic of honor. I want us to turn to the book of Malachi. We're going to go to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4. This is where our text is coming from. Malachi 4 and verse 5. And it reads, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. He shall turn the heart heart of the fathers to the children and notice the heart of the children to their fathers this is a prophecy by malachi malachi is prophesying of a coming time of reconciliation indeed a time of restoration Um, according to malachi the prophet just before the great and notable day of the Lord, that is the day in which God will come and rapture and take his people out of the earth, God promises and prophesies through the prophet Malachi that there will be a time of reconciliation, indeed a time of restoration, when the hearts of the children shall be turned back to the fathers. Now, We know that this has a a spiritual implication here, and that is uh, Malachi is actually prophesying that God's original children, uh, the uh, Hebrews, the Jews, will eventually turn back to their heavenly father. That is, they will repent, call upon the name of the Lord, and uh, there will be a revival among the Jews. But this prophecy is also speaking of a time of reconciliation within the family unit. I believe that uh, God is going to bring about a restoration not only among his spiritual family, but I believe that in this time of revival, in that time of restoration, there will be a reconciliation uh, between fathers and their children and the hearts of the children, as Malachi prophesied, will be turned back to their fathers, a meaning that their fathers will once again have honor in their eyes. Um, they will begin to honor their father. And so we know that um, we're really on a verge of this great end time revival when we start seeing honor restored both as it relates to God, our Heavenly Father, and as it relates to fathers in general. This is a real sign of revival when honor is being restored. And this is what we need to be praying for. We need to be praying that honor be restored back in the home and honor be restored back in the church. And um, and that's what I really want to talk to you today about, honor. Um, honor is something that we don't uh, hear talked about all that much today. Um, even still, um, it plays such a major role in our life, especially among men. 
especially among men. In fact, we might even say that manhood and honor are inextricably tied together. They are inseparable. When you talk about manhood, you cannot truly talk about genuine manhood and what it means to be a man and what men hold dear without also talking about honor because the two are so closely tied together. Uh, you know, it wasn't all, all that long ago when men would often go to great lengths in order to gain or protect their honor. Um, there was a time when men would meet together on what was called the field of honor and they would duel it out for the purpose, as I said, of defending and protecting their honor. Um, today, we don't really use words like duel anymore or field of honor, but that doesn't mean that honor um, is not valued today in our society and among, as, as I said, the men of our, of our society. In fact, it might be argued that uh, what we're seeing today in um, our modern day is a modern day duel over honor. The resistance we see among um, young African-American males and law enforcement, uh, this could be a modern day type of duel over honor. Um, we see a lot of times young black men um, resisting, as it were, um, uh, law enforcement or officers, but many don't realize that it, it could be that these young black men, their resistance is really a sign that their honor is being threatened. And uh, many of them are trying to defend it. And uh, similarly, some in law enforcement might equally feel that the reason why they're so aggressive uh, towards uh, citizens, men, young black men in particular, is because they believe their honor is being threatened. And so I believe that, as I said, much of what we see today could in fact just be a, a struggle for honor. Men trying to, in their mind, uh, stand up for and fight to defend um, the honor of, of their own manhood and uh, just having respect or being treated with a certain amount of respect. And so why are, why are men, you know, sometimes you, you see, you know, um, I think women would see men, maybe even young boys, maybe their their sons wrestling in in, in the basement or out on the front lawn, and they're saying, why are you always competing against each other? Why is this there's always a struggle? Um, many times, you men are constantly struggling because they're trying to protect their rep, as they call it, or what we're talking about today, their honor. Honor is such a big thing, and I believe um, that the reason why it's so important to men because it plays such an important part of a man's identity. A man has a strong desire um, for honor or to be honored, and um, so much so that the loss of honor often feels like an attack against their own manhood. If you really want to emasculate a man and humble a man, take from him respect, take from him honor. If a man um, is lacking honor and respect, particularly in his own home and from his family, many times he will feel less than a man. And the reason is, is because honor is uh, so much a part of a man's um, identity. And so what do we do in a day like today when um, there seems to be so few who are actually honoring or receiving honor? Um, does the Bible have anything to say about this issue of honor? Um, 
we just read in Malachi how God promises in the last day uh, to bring a restoration of all things, including, it's important that we note this, that God includes in this restoration in the last times, in the end time revival, a restoration of honor back to the fathers, a restoration of this family and their children honoring once again uh, their father. And so um, what do we do in the meantime, though? What do we do before there is uh, this revival? Um, are there things we can do as it relates to this issue of honor? I believe there is. I believe the Bible has a few things that um, it can teach us regarding honor. And um, I want us to turn to Romans chapter 13. And uh, Romans chapter 13, one of the first things that I want to share with you um, that the Bible teaches us regarding honor, it is this. Number one, this is the first principle. Principle one is give honor to whom honor is due. Uh, this is one of the things that the Bible teaches us. It teaches us that as it relates to honor, it's so very important that we, each of us, give honor to whomever honor is due. Um, in Romans chapter 13 and verse 7, we read these words, Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, and honor to whom honor is due. Um, according to scripture, there are certain individuals who are in fact due or deserving of our honor. And uh, the Bible has a uh, list of few of these individuals. I want to run through them real quickly. Um, rather than, you know, turning to each of these, I encourage you just to write down these uh, particular references. The first um, individuals that the Bible commands us um, to honor, individuals whom God says is due or deserving of honor, is our parents. Our parents. Um, it says in Ephesians 6 and 2, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. So our fathers, our mothers, our parents are worthy or deserving of honor. Also, the Bible talks about elders, our elders, that is those who are older than us, the aged are worthy of honor. It says in Leviticus 19 and 32, uh, thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man. Fear thy God, I am the Lord. I think it's interesting that the Bible tells us or he informs the children of Israel to honor those who are older than you, um, our seniors. This is why we're taught as young people, as children, to say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, uh, to those who are older than us. Why? Because God commands us to honor those who are older than us. In fact, he says in Leviticus, he says, honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. Meaning, look, you know, uh, God is not going to take it very lightly if we don't. So we're to honor our parents. We're to honor those who are older than us. Also, the Bible tells us to honor our employers, our employers. In 1 Timothy 6 and 1, it says, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. So we are to honor our masters and or that's relating to our employers, those who supervise us in the workplace. We're to give them all honor. I know a lot of times we work on jobs and uh, we don't too much uh, like our employers. And sometimes we might find ourselves disrespecting them. But God tells us that they are worthy. They are due and deserving our honor. Also, um, we are to honor those leaders in the church. He says, let the elders that rule well, that is in the church, be counted worthy of double honor. 
especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. A lot of times, you know, we we might honor our boss because, you know, they're paying us. But when we get to church and the leaders in the church uh, are often treated with less than the respect they are due. You got to remember that even in church that we are to be honoring uh, those who uh, minister to us and who are over us in the Lord. We live in a day where a lot of ministers are are and um, are being defamed um, in public. Uh, they're being treated with less than respect. But God tells us as it relates to honor, it's it is important that we give honor to those who are leaders in the church. And then also the Bible talks about in Ephesians 5 and 33, he says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself and the wife see that she reverence or honor her husband. So husbands are also worthy of honor. Um, wives out there, your husband, you know, is worthy of your honor and your respect. In fact, there shouldn't be another man on the planet whom you respect more than your husband. Um, you shouldn't even respect um, your father more than you respect your husband. That's, that's your husband. You are one. God expects you to honor him, honor him. And um, lastly, just as a way of just bringing it all in, God commands us to honor everybody in authority. In fact, it says in 1 Peter 2 and 13, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be the king as supreme, verse 14, or unto governors um, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well, verse 17, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. So everyone who's in authority, all of our, our government officials, our politicians, our lawmakers, mayors, governors, even our president, we are to, according to scripture, honor them. Again, um, this is something that we don't hear much talk about. We just live in a society where we freely and so readily um, withhold honor from men to whom the Bible says is due. And so it's very important that from the outset, we understand that as it comes to the real issue of honor, we are to give honor uh, to those to whom it is due. Now, I wanna just say this as an addition that we often feel that we're only required to honor those who meet or live up to a particular standard. You know, some of you out there might be thinking, Pastor, I understand what you're saying. I get all that. But what if the individual that I'm commanded to honor uh, does not live up to a standard that is honorable? Uh, what if I have a husband who acts in an un in a manner that is not honorable, or a parent who acts um, in a manner that is not honorable, or a leader in the church, or a leader in government, or in the community. What are we to do when we're faced with those in authority who are not living up to a standard that demands our respect and, and honor? Um, well, my, my, my statement to you, my answer to you is this, the Bible commands us to honor all who are in authority, regardless of their virtue or achievements. The Bible doesn't say honor those who are in authority who live virtuously. He commands us to honor all in a, the position of authority, whether they act virtuous or not regardless of their achievements. My father never provided me with a safe home environment. Therefore, I can disrespect him. No, you cannot. If you notice in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, he says, servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the 
froward. That word means the evil. Um, individuals who are not, as we say, living up to the standard um, that deserves our respect. Notice it says in verse 19, for this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience towards God, not because the person deserves your honor, but for conscience towards God, endure grief and suffering wrongfully. Um, sometimes we need to know all times we need to honor those in authority, not for their sake, but for God's sake. I want to repeat that. I want you to hear me. Um, God expects you to honor all of those individuals I pointed out, not for their sake, but for God's sake. And what do I mean by that? Well, we need to understand this issue about honor. And that is honor, every man or person we're commanded to honor in life stands in that place of honor as an extension of God's honor. So we honor them as a way of honoring God. And if we dishonor them, we are actually dishonoring God. Um, in Romans 13, let's um, look back there. In Romans 13 and verse 1, notice what it says. It says, let every soul, Romans 13 and 1, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. That word means authorities. For there is no power, no person in authority but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. So everyone that's in authority in our life was put there in that authority by God. Is there by God. In verse 2 it says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power or resisteth the authority resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation or judgment. And so God takes it very personal when we um, withhold honor from those to whom he placed in authority because their authority is an extension of his authority. All you got to do is read the book of Numbers when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. Uh, they came to a point where they began to rebel against Moses and Aaron's authority. And God appeared to Moses and said to Moses that they are not rebelling against you, Moses. They are rebelling against me because I called you. I called Aaron to bring them out of Egypt and through the wilderness. So if they are upset with you, they're really upset with my choice. A lot of times we get upset with those who are in authority over us. Again, whether it's our boss, our parent, our spouse, or even our, our government leader, because we have this idea that they got there by accident. But we forget or we don't realize that they are there because God put them there. And so to reject their authority is to also reject and put into question God's um, authority in placing them there, his decision to place them there. And, um, and, and there are a lot of people who don't agree with this. They don't agree that it's good to give honor or respect to someone who hasn't earned it, earned it. They think that if we give respect to people and give honor to people who don't deserve it, then it makes honor meaningless. It makes it meaningless. No, it doesn't. You know what it makes honor? It makes honor um, the responsibility of God and not man. You know, God is the one who sets the standards of honor. You know, a lot of people think that they're the ones or society is the one who sets the standards of who we are to honor. But God is the one who sets the standard because everybody who is in honor is really sharing in God's honor. At the end of the day, the only one who is ultimately worthy of any honor is God. And every man on this planet who receives honor only receives it because God has given them 
that honor. He has been willing to share his honor. So if it's God's honor to begin with, God can decide who gets it. He can decide how it's how it's received and, and who's deserving of it. And if he says everyone in authority is deserving of honor, then we need to take that and we need to abide by that. If he says our parents are worthy of honor because he's given that to them or our employers or our leaders in the church, our leaders in the community, then we need to accept that. And to rebel against that, again, is to rebel against God. And and so when we consider this first principle, it makes what we're witnessing today in our society a real challenge for Christians. I firmly believe that, that this is a test, that God is testing. He is testing our willingness to submit to his principles of honor by putting in positions of honor individuals we deem unworthy or we feel unworthy to challenge us to see if we will obey the word and the standards and the principles he has set in the church or if we're going to just go by our own arbitrary rules and standards. You know, sometimes God challenges our obedience by placing us in a position that is uncomfortable, that requires us to either obey his word and experience some discomfort or do what we feel um, is right in our own minds in order to escape what we feel is, you know, uncomfortable situations. And God, again, he's challenging. Just Christians, we're living in a, a time where our, our honor for God is really being challenged. Will we honor God by giving honor to those whom he says are deserving of that honor, or will we stand with the world and honor only those who live up to, as I said, our arbitrary rules and standards? It comes down to that very question. Who determines the standard of honor, God or man? And I want to go to our, our next point today that I believe the Bible uh, teaches us about honor, the next principle, and that is stop taking honor and learn to give it. When it comes to an issue of honor, one of the principles that the Bible teaches us is to don't take honor. Instead, instead, learn to give it. Give honor and don't always seek to take honor. Uh, let's turn to Philippians uh, chapter 2. So many individuals in the body of Christ are are more focused on um, taking honor, making sure people respect you, demanding honor, commanding honor, rather than being more interested in giving honor. We should be more interested in giving honor than we are in making sure we get honor from people, whether it's in our home, on our job. You're going to respect me. You're going to honor me. You know, some of us, that's our main focus is to make sure people respect us and honor us. That's, that's the wrong focus. When you read, when we read scripture, we find out that God wants us to be more concerned with giving honor than we are with getting it or even taking it. Here in Philippians chapter two, in verse three, it says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in all lowliness of mind, watch, let each esteem or honor the other better than themselves. Let each be focused on esteeming and honoring others more than themselves. Verse four, look not every man on his own things. We might say, look not every man on his own honor, but every man on on the things of others. In other words, be more concerned with making sure you give honor to others rather than focused on people giving honor to you. Um, and when we begin to see honor as something to be given rather than something for us to be focused on receiving or getting, 
we will understand a very, very important principle in Scripture, and that is giving honor is actually a way we show love to each other. It's an act of love. God wants us giving honor because he wants us operating in love. You know, we talk about love. We often talk about the goosebumps we feel. But if you really want to love someone, give them honor. You know, in fact, we just read that in Ephesians. How wives, if you're going to love your husband, you really want to love your, your man. You really, really want to love your husband. Uh, children, you really want to love your father. You know, the best way to love a man or a person in authority is to respect them. You give them respect. They see that as you giving them love. That's the way we love. In fact, if you look back at verse two of Philippians, Philippians two and two, notice it says, fulfill ye my joy that you be like-minded. Notice having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better. So we see here that esteeming others Honoring others is the way we have the same love for one another. Just like you love being respected, just like you love being honored, will give that love to someone else by honoring and respecting them. You know, that's where our focus needs to be. And, um, if, on the other hand, we're more focused on seizing honor for ourselves, then we're not acting in love. You know what we're acting in? We're acting in pride. It's exactly what he says. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. That's pride. In other words, if you're not giving honor to others, you're acting in vain glory and you're creating an environment of strife. There, there, Strife is created oftentimes when people are fighting to demand that others respect them. That's where the fight is. That's, that's why, you know, the, the, the police officer and the man are fighting on the ground. They're, 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 they're demanding to be respected. Uh, the law enforcement is demanding to be respected. The man on the ground is demanding to be respected. And whenever everybody is trying to seize honor for themselves, there's always going to be strife. And as Paul points out, it's always going to be an act of pride. And there's a lot of confusion in the body of Christ today between pride and honor. You know, we, we really don't fully understand the, that there is a difference between pride and honor. Um, a lot of people think that they're um, defending their own honor. Where really what they're doing is they're acting in pride. See, honor is recognition that is received from others. You, you cannot take honor. You can only receive it. You say, I'm going to demand that you respect me. Well, you can't do that. Respect isn't demanded. It's received. You, you, respect is, is a gift that someone gives to you. You cannot demand it. You cannot require it. Only God can require it because it's his to give. And it's not yours to take. And we misunderstand this. We think that we're, we're protecting our honor when we require people to, to respect us. But really what you're doing, you're acting in pride. Pride seeks to seize recognition for itself. Um, honor receives recognition prior. Uh, pride seizes it. It seizes it. And prior, pride always ends in shame. Whenever you try to take and make and force somebody to respect you, it's going to end not in your honor. It's going to end in your shame. In Proverbs 11, you know, that's why we wonder, why, man, why do my children hate me? Because <laughs> you try to make them honor you. Whenever you try to make people honor you, 
they're going to, you're going to be, instead of getting honor, you're going to be dishonored. You're going to be dishonored. It says in Proverbs 11 and verse two, he says, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. But with the lowly is wisdom. See, pride, pride, seeking recognition for yourself will always end in shame. Whenever you see pride, shame is to follow. Whenever you go after your own uh, recognition, whenever you're trying to do it yourself and, and, and make it yourself and require it yourself, you're going to end in shame because you're, you're looking out for you. He said, well, don't parents demand that their kids respect them? They demand, they should demand that their kids walk in honor, whether it's them or the school teacher. What a parent should be teaching a child is an understanding of respecting people in authority. It's not so much respecting me as a person, respecting my position. And you're teaching a child to recognize people in authority and respecting that. It's not so much personal as it is a principle. It's a principle, you know. So, you know, God tells us that we are not to be exalting ourselves or seeking after our own honor. And um, but honor is something that the Bible teaches us we should be more concerned in giving. You give honor. Now, don't be so concerned with getting it or even seizing it and demanding it. Um, we come to our, our last point. One final principle I want to share with you today regarding this subject of honor. And this, this honor is received through humility. If you're in a position of authority and you feel like, you know, you're not receiving the honor you deserve, understand this. Honor is received through humility, through humility. Uh, let's turn to Proverbs 15. You're at Proverbs 11. Let's turn to 15, Proverbs 15, just a few pages. Honor is received through humility. It says here in Proverbs 15 and 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor is humility. Before honor is humility. I'm always opposed to giving people or placing people in positions of power or positions of authority who haven't gone through a season of humility. If you put a person in a position of authority who haven't first learned humility, you're setting them up for disaster because they're more likely to fall into pride. This is why Paul um, advised Timothy uh, not to make an elder out of a novice, lest he be um, tempted of the devil and brought to shame. Someone who's never experienced or had a gone through a time of humility and humbling of themselves and you place them in a position of honor, you really are doing it out of order. It's like building a house without laying a foundation. The Bible says uh, genuine honor comes after humility. Humility must always be present before you can receive the honor that comes from God. And uh, there's a lot of confusion around humility. And we talked to you about the confusion people have between pride and honor. There's equal confusion uh, between shame and humility. See, humility is another word that we don't hear a lot about today because people often equate it with shame. You know, oh, that's a shame. No. We have to understand that there's a difference between shame and humility. What's that difference? Well, unlike humility, shame never leads to honor. Shame never leads to honor. It might lead to repentance. It might lead to conversion, but it doesn't lead to honor. You know, shame is 
is the feeling that you feel when you know you've done something wrong. You know, there, there are people who feel shame and, oh man, I'm, sh- I can't believe I blew it. Yeah, you blew it. And uh, some people think that they got to blow it 50 million times before, you know, they can be in a position of honor. Blowing it doesn't qualify you to be in a position of honor. See, some people think that, you know, I'm, I got to go through every, you know, Paul went through, Jesus went through. The only difference though is you're going through is because of your transgressions. You, you keep doing stupid things. You know, some of the things we're going through, we don't have to go through, you know, uh, being punished or being shamed for doing wrong things does not qualify a person for leadership. That's shame. That's not humility. Shame is does not precede honor. It might lead you to repentance, which is a good thing. It might be the reason why you know you turn to God and are converted, but shame is not a prerequisite for honor. It never leads to honor, you know. God doesn't honor you because you accept responsibility over wrongs you do. Oh, God, you know, I'm I'm accepting responsibility. Now put me in authority. No, you don't. You don't get authority. You don't receive honor because you step up and accept responsibility. That's what some, unfortunately, a lot of men do. They. Um, are irresponsible in terms of being fathers or husbands. And then they finally come around and says, you know what? I did wrong. You know, you're absolutely right. And w- they expect that with that confession of, of, of being wrong, they, when they accept the shame, then their family should just automatically, everybody be on board and ready to follow them. Now, biblically speaking, they should, you know, they should treat you with some respect, but I'm telling you, you expect to get honor just because you accept responsibility, you're sorely mistaken. That's not humility. No, if you want to be exalted, then we must exercise humility, meaning we must accept unearned shame. That's what humility is, accepting shame that we didn't earn in order to honor or exalt somebody else. You know, taking a low stance that you didn't really have to take for the purpose of exalting or honoring somebody else, that's humility. You know, taking things you don't deserve, enduring grief and suffering wrongfully, that's humility. This is why God commands us to accept the shame of honoring people in authority, particularly those who don't deserve it, that if you accept the shame, because it will be shame among your peers, your family members, why in the world do you respect them? Why in the world are you doing that? Because by honoring them and humbling myself and submitting to God's commands to treat them with respect and honor, I put myself in a position to receive honor. See, that's who God gives honor to, people who humble themselves, accept shame that they don't deserve for the righteous purpose, either to please God or keep his commandments or to exalt another person to give them honor. And um, and this is being challenged in the church. D- humility is being challenged. You know, uh, many are seeking their own honor They're seeking for equality rather than positioning themselves through humility to be recipients of God's honor and God's exaltation. You know, if you feel like you're under the thumb of someone and you're not being treated as an equal and uh, you're not receiving the recognition you feel you deserve, the way to get it is not by trying to seize that equality and demand that people treat you with respect. The way to get it is through humility. If you humble yourself, then God will exalt you above those who's withholding the honor that you deserve. Look at Philippians chapter two again. See, we, we, I, we know what we want. We just don't know how to get there. You, you want to be treated with respect. You want equality, civil rights. You won't receive the things you have, but you're going about it the wrong way. God says, if you would 
through humility, humble your, if you will humble yourself and rather than trying to seize equality, if you will humble yourself and do what God tells you to do, then God will exalt you. Here it says in Philippians 2 and 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So he did it before us. Who, notice, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So it says that Jesus was deserving of the same honor that God had. He told his disciples, you believe in God, believe also in me. He could have easily said, you honor God, honor me. You respect God, respect me. You worship God, worship me. But how did he go about that though? He didn't just walk around and tell people, I'm the son of God, all y'all bow down to me. He didn't even want people to, to know he was the son of God. He didn't require it. He didn't try to seize that equality. I am the son of God. Give me my right as the son of God. You are withholding my right. No, he didn't do that. The Bible says, even though he was in the form of God, even though he was equal with God, he thought it not robbery. One translation says he did not cease to seize it. He didn't seize equality. He didn't grab it with his hands. It was his, it belonged to him, but he didn't try to take it for himself. What did he do? The Bible says in verse seven, but he made himself of no reputation. And notice what he took. He took upon him the form of a servant, humility. He took something he didn't earn. He didn't earn to be treated like a servant. He deserved to be treated like a king, like God. But he took a form, the form of a servant and was made in likeness of men. Verse eight, being found in fashion as a man. Notice he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is what he did. You know, a lot of men out there, you'll find that if you would learn, instead of trying to be the man in your home and learn to be the servant, people will start treating you like the man. You want to know why the church loves Christ so much? You want to know why we worship Jesus and we will give anything for him? Because he gave everything for us. Because when he came to the earth, he didn't sit back and and just prounce around and, and wanted everybody to acknowledge him. He humbled himself and gave of himself. And that sacrifice constrains us to want to honor him back. This is how you get your wife to honor you. This is how you get your children to honor you. This is how you get people you lead to honor you. It's by showing them you're willing to accept shame for their honor. When you show them that their honor is more important to you than your own honor, then they will want to give you honor. And this is what we read in verse nine. He says, wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name, which is, see, God gave him that honor. See, again, honor belongs to God. It comes from God. Everyone in authority who has, has been given that honor by God. And if you want God to give you honor, he only gives honor to those who are humbling themselves, who are humbling themselves. And uh, God never designed us uh, to take honor or try to receive it from men. He wants to be the one to give us that honor. You got so many people trying to please man trying to get their honor. See, this is what the world, the world gives us honor if we got enough money, enough popularity, um, if we got a, a, enough education, then they're willing to give us their honor. And this is why we try to jump through loops. We try to do this. We try to uh, climb the corporate ladder. Um, we try to gain as many degrees as we can because we're all out to get honor from man. But why do we want honor from individuals who don't even honor God? I don't know about you. I don't want honor from people who can't even discern the one who is worthy of all honor, and that's God. 
If the world won't even honor God, I care nothing about their honor. I care nothing about their fame. I don't want them to recognize me. I don't, I don't give a rip what they think about me. The person I care most about, the one I want to receive honor from is the Lord. And for some reason, church people are so interested in getting honor from men, which is why they do what the world does in order to to get honor by seizing it, demanding it, fighting for it. They won't humble themselves. The church is being challenged. We don't see it. All we see are our protest injustices and things. And what we don't see is a challenge. God has placed us in a particular challenge to challenge our humility, to challenge our obedience, to challenge whether or not we believe that he's the giver of honor, to challenge whether or not we will honor those who God tells us to honor, whether we like them or not, whether they do things we enjoy or not. He's challenging us. And if we can't, if we can't pass this test, we don't want to see the tests that are coming down the road. Some of us are failing the tests we got in front of us. Some of us are failing the tests in our own home. Now, this is my prayer. My prayer is that we will see, not just in the last days, in the time of the revival, that we will see even in our day to day. Honor restored. My prayer is that God will begin to restore honor in the church and restore honor in our particular homes. And um, and as we're praying, as we're waiting for God to restore this, my advice, my my encouragement to you out there is that you will be rem- reminded never to be guilty of withholding honor from those who are in authority. Don't ever be guilty of that. Give the people who is worthy of your honor what is due them. Some of us got some got some debts that we owe in terms of honor. Some of us need to call up our parents that we went withholding honor from and pay our debts. You know, on today, if you're father is still alive, you owe him something. I don't care if he was ever a good father to you. He's your father. You owe him something and you need to go pay your debt today. If you got to go drive to see him, if you got to swallow your pride to call him on the phone, go in your pocket, do something and pay your debt and pay it not just to your father, pay it to your husband, pay it to your employer Pay it to your uh, leaders in church, in government, in society. Stop getting on Facebook and robbing the person that you owe honor to. You're taking honor from them and you should be giving honor to them. Why? Out of obedience to God. You need to see their authority as an extension of God's authority. And when you hate that authority, you are hating and rebelling against God. Some of us need to go on Facebook and write posts that are just as long in repenting about dishonoring individuals of authority as we have spent, um, you know, crucifying their character. We owe them that. We owe them that. This is how you want to honor God. I'm, I'm tired of people, you know, Lord, I love you. And you hating the people he put in authority. That's false love. And I'm telling you, you out there demanding and seeking for your own honor, it's unrighteous. It's God says it's, unri- it's not the standard. That's not the standard. The standard is the is Christ. Have the mind of Christ who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Stop trying to get a reputation. Stop fighting for your rep. What are you fighting for a reputation for? You've been bought with the price. You're nothing. Let God give it to you. If you lose your reputation, you will get a reputation. (sighs) 
I, my prayer is that you would uh, see these things that we've talked to you today about. Um, again, I'm, I'm eager to see uh, a restoration of honor. Uh, I want to see a revival in that regard. A revival of restoration of honor. Um, hope you got uh, something out of um, those words today. I want to pray for you, Lord. We pray today for these, your people. Um, we pray for all those who are in authority, all of our leaders, whatever position they hold in the home, in society, in the church. Father, we ask that you would forgive us uh, for every act of dishonor where we've robbed them, your ministers, um, your representatives. And uh, we know that by robbing them, we somehow robbed you of your honor and for that, we repent. We call on you for mercy. Lord, have mercy on us today. Help us, Lord, to restore and recon reconcile with those um, individuals in authority. Um, I pray today, Father, for, um, for men today who feel like they um, have been robbed of their honor who are running on E as it relates to their honor. I pray, Father God, that you would give them the honor that they need, that they won't have to seek it from men. They won't have to seek it from their family, their jobs, their places of employment, the community, but it will be enough to them that you honor them. Lord, we thank you that you said in your word, you have delivered us out of the kingdom of darkness. And you have exalted us and made us sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. There's no greater honor than that. Open our eyes to see that you've honored us through the gift of salvation and the Holy Spirit. Minister now to our hearts. Bless these, your people. We thank you in advance for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Give me what to say. Let me hear you. Thank you for listening. If this teaching has been a blessing to you and you'd like to partner with our ministry to share the message of Jesus Christ, please visit our website at www.hmclive.org and click the donate button. If you're in our area, we invite you to join us at 4317 Lippincott Boulevard, Burton, Michigan, 48519, Harris Memorial, Church of God in Christ, teaching the truth and showing the love.